Uh, long title, let's just say natural language processing and anomaly detection. Um, and that's quite too long, especially if you just had lunch. Um, so uh, this is me, or otherwise known as the goose. So hint, hint. If it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, but it needs batteries, you probably have the wrong abstraction. But also, if you haven't figured it out yet, I am the golden goose. So uh, brush up a, beside me with a badge and apparently my face shows up, which I didn't consent to beforehand, but that's Mike. <laughs> that's Mike for you. I'm getting used to it. So I mean, it, it gets better every year. At PyCon one year, uh, Mike blocked my wireless mic right in the middle of the talk, so <laughs> good times. Uh, oh yeah, so just obviously B-sides, a wasp, and just kind of a all over the place kind of person, So, but very much a Python dev and DevOps. Um, so a little bit of a wasp, we have a meetup. It feels like we died this year because we were a bit slow, but we're still alive. So please attend in future as we do builds up towards B-side as well. Um, and then the general outline. So I'm trying to pitch this more as not, uh, first of all, I'm not a machine learning expert at, at all. I also want to pitch this in a way that um, you take something home and go experiment yourself. This is kind of what I've been working with in my master's. Uh, my master's was mostly on anomaly detection at first, and then it kind of took a detour. And I'll talk a bit about that. But the idea is that um, a lot of uh, Python and a lot of machine learning tools in Python have become easy for the everyday person to use, not although with great power comes great responsibility, but the idea being that you should at least try or see what the tools can do for you. Um, it's not just for the domain of the super nerds. I mean, most of us are probably in that domain already, but um, so like I said, introductory talk, um, not done with all the research, I'm not an expert. And there might be lots of words, so uh, especially after lunch, that is troubling. And uh, let's see. And sometimes, especially on a day like this, I feel like I'm talking like this. I haven't slept much. And uh, I might have lead poisoning thanks to the badge, but we'll see <laughs> about that. Uh, no burns on the hands this year, so that's a good sign. But... Hopefully, there's something you can understand. So generally, the problem, at first, I just looked at anomaly detection um, because uh, for me, the holy grail is to find something that wasn't there that you didn't even know about. So a new zero day or something that no one um, saw before. And uh, the problem is that we're starting to do a lot of microservices. Um, We've got huge log volumes, uh, writing grep and scripts just to analyze logs uh, become tiresome, and we've got so many sources. Um, and not everything is nece necessarily in a time series already. Um, so how can we make this a little bit easier in the future? And then um, static analysis doesn't catch everything. Um, you know, it's, it's still difficult for us to find a normal behavior in systems and different log formats, and the high volume just makes it a, a, a difficult problem to solve at the moment. Um, not that I'm saying the methods out there already aren't working, it's just trying to find new ways to do things. Um, so yeah, the kind of the hypothesis is just that natural language processing and machine learning techniques um, could help scale and identify previously unknown vulnerabilities um, and just make your life easier. And because um, I did this talk before, I thought I might just actually brush up on some of the terms that people might not know uh, briefly. Uh, so I mean system calls, you're talking to the kernel, executing things on the system, um, and you're trying to access a resource on, on your kernel. So you've got things like process creation, main memory, memory allocation, um, devices, network, file access, uh, Etc. and even uh, protecting the kernel itself. Uh, there might be some syscalls around that. Um, dynamic analysis, so uh, I looked at static analysis first, but 
Then um, from a scale and DevOps perspective, I found it interesting to look at actually running as much code as possible and then finding uh, vulnerabilities in the logs after all with rapid change and people just pulling any Docker container from the internet. Um, dynamic analysis is gonna be essential and we wanna execute it in real time and see what it actually does. So make it actually behave like we expect it to do. Um, there's so many different definitions for artificial intelligence and it's become such a big thing. I think it's much easier if we look at that. Um, so we've got natural language processing, machine learning, uh, computer vision, speech, and many others. And um, uh, we see it all over the place already. Um, and then machine learning, uh, you know, we're fo focusing much more on the data and analytical models. And then towards more what I was looking at is natural language processing. So uh, processing our natural languages in a way that a computer actually understands and can respond. Um, and just data that we can derive from our own languages. Uh, anything you type into Google these days and or even Siri. And then uh, lastly, or not necessarily last, not lastly, um, we actually want to classify what we find. So we want to group things together. We want to classify it either as abnormal or normal. We want to classify it as part of a group or not. Um, so machine learning is used a lot in classification. Um, it makes, makes our lives easier there. And then just for whoever might not know, we, when we're talking about logs, anything that when the application is actually running, it's saving uh, a a log of what it's been doing, uh, activities, things it's accessed, uh, errors, execution. And uh, obviously anomaly in its most basic form is just a deviation from the norm. Um, something that went wrong, something we're not expecting. Um, luckily the human mind's quite good at actually identifying anomalies, especially visually, but uh, for this, um, overall we wanna find anomalies in the data itself. And um, if you look at, for instance, Elasticsearch already has some anomaly detection built in. Um, for time series data, it's not a, it's not a new thing, but um, I myself haven't even used it enough in um, Elasticsearch. But essentially, um, a lot of our systems do the same thing over and over every day. So we, we really wanna find the things that are quite abnormal, not like uh, Black Friday being uh, seen as a DDoS, but um, seeing actual uh, overloading traffic or uh, a increase in syscalls that are completely out of the norm. So the big thing is that we want some kind of baseline or something that looks normal and then find the abnormalities. And we get different kinds of uh, abnormalities just to quickly uh, touch on that, point anomalies, uh, contextual anomalies, and collective anomalies. And then uh, kind of the, the hypothesis that I have is that even though this is coming from a machine, to some extent there's human language in it, so we can analyze it to some extent as a human language. And um, I mean, it's words that we can understand. So how can we actually do that? Okay. Um, and then um, I actually went and looked at different sources for logs. Um, so obviously finding uh, logs with anomalies in them already was a bit difficult. But I looked at application logs, event logs, service logs, system logs, obviously. Um, and um, at the time I decided to focus mostly on syscall logs, um, especially because uh, you can pick up on a lot of things uh, like files being changed, open. You can see uh, sockets being created or uh, processes attaching to sockets. Um, we've got a lot of uh, what you might call anomalous behavior you might be able to pick up based on what the program is doing. So um, is it connecting to the internet? Is it changing files? Is it mapping memory? Is it changing or, or attempting to access other processes? 
So um, I want to look at the system calls themselves. Now, the problem with system calls, though, would be that we've got a lot of um, events in a system, a lot of logs, but it might give us a good uh, insight into what we're looking for. Uh, just an easy example of a system call is uh, opening a file. Um, just to give you an idea um, what, what we might be looking at later. And then purely for my research, I decided to focus on Linux syscalls and x86 um, because of the data that I could access. Uh, VirusTotal has a lot of ELF binaries. Um, if you ask them under uh, academic uh, access, so uh, thankfully being at Rhodes and doing my masters, I was able to get access to quite a lot of binaries. Um, and then uh, for the most part, I use uh, S-Trace just to um, look at what the, the actual binaries are doing and get data out of it. Um, S-Trace is easy and we've all used it before at some point. But then I also found Sysdig. Um, Although I didn't use the whole ecosystem, um, they have a whole cloud um, ecosystem where um, they're quite focused on um, monitoring and security, but very much on Docker, which was one of the things that I found um, useful in my research. And also they were focusing on cloud and Kubernetes, so you could extend it quite a bit. Um, it allowed you to uh, trace all the syscalls for a specific container so I didn't have to do a lot more uh, tooling around the container. The only problem being that it has a kernel module. And um, if you've got secure boot, it might uh, give you some trouble. And um, so uh, the idea being that I would isolate uh, one of the binaries in a container and then look at what it was doing inside um, of Docker. But I'll get to that um, in a bit. And uh, yeah, so the relevance for me was that uh, it does things like opening files, uh, accessing memory addresses, or um, setting memory. And um, we already have some syscalls that we know are problematic, or something like starts another process. Um, we we have an idea of what to look like, uh, look at, and we we especially know uh, with the network what we'll be looking at, and I'll, um, especially because I was looking at Docker as well, um, the problems that I saw was uh, file, file system access, network access, and uh, process manipulation, especially with the vulnerabilities of Docker lately, um, especially because you're running a daemon on the host, uh, the network calls were, were important to look at. Although it also has some issues dealing with it, uh, large log size, um, just doing simple testing. I had to do uh, very short events, otherwise I'd run out of RAM processing it, um, permissions and access, and then shipping it off the host. So obviously I'm uh, executing binaries, so I want to kind of isolate my machine as much as possible, um, ran it in a virtual machine, in a Docker, and um, hardened Docker as well. So some challenges also in your environments, actually shipping the logs off to a centralized host so you can process it as well. And uh, why containers? Um, not just because I'm really interested in it, but I wanted to isolate the binary from the noise of the overall system to some extent and that it wasn't aware of everything else running and to isolate my work machine as well. Um, at the time, and um, also uh, because Docker itself has seen interesting uh, vulnerabilities around the daemon itself and the run times and uh, the network being attacked. Um, yeah, as well because I found Sysdig and uh, it worked so well with Docker, um, a lot less tooling had to be built around getting the, the logs straight off the Docker daemon, uh, the Docker container running, and then um, we'll get to some of the stuff next. Um, also looked at 
uh, secure computing mode in Linux. Um, so uh, because I'm trying to find things that are um, that haven't been found before that are anomalous to the normal behavior, I want to limit it as well. So I don't want a container just running, you know, root, easiest attack surface. We actually want to see if we can find something that's completely abnormal. Um, and uh, SECOMP allows you to block specific uh, syscalls, which is rather handy in that, that sense. Um, and then uh, I spoke about this last year in the Lightning Talks. Google's Gvisor um, already, I'll get to Gvisor later, but already had default SECOMP rules applied and further abstraction for each Docker container. So the network's abstracted, uh, the process is isolated, um, but not all cases accounted for, which is kind of part of the, the point, is I don't want to block everything, but I want to see um, whatever what's outside of a baseline. Uh, just an example of a SECOMP rule. And then uh, you could just easily apply it to any Docker container if you weren't using something like Gvisor um, when it's running. So uh, why Gvisor? Um, so uh, already um, you're not running a hypervisor, you're not running a virtual machine. So you're much closer to the actual system surface, to the syscall, to the file system, to the network. Um, so Google built a very lightweight and fast um, micro hypervisor to isolate the, the process and some of the network calls. And they've also already applied default um, SECOMP rules and things that they find um, problematic and when they released Python 3.7 on Google Cloud, um, this was the default way to actually run uh, their uh, cloud functions. And uh, it kind of looks like that. So you've got a shim in between the host kernel and the application, and then it proxies system calls and network calls in between um, with a block list as well, so that uh, the host kernel is still isolated. Um, it's not completely isolated, but adds a level of abstraction. And uh, why I looked at Gvisor is they had an interesting list of things that they did support and things that weren't supported yet. So uh, this, uh, this was a hint of which kind of syscalls they found still problematic, didn't have block lists for. Postgres only got added about six months ago, I think. Um, because of a way it said, it said process IDs, I think, when it did concurrency, if I remember correctly. So um, also this gives me an interesting list of things to use as a baseline. So I can run uh, Prometheus, I can run Postgres, I can run Elasticsearch in a container and see that as a baseline um, and then compare it to something else. And uh, Gvisor is also interesting because it also integrates with Kubernetes. And initially, when I looked at this research, um, the, the vulnerability of the Docker daemon itself would um, add further attack surface to Kubernetes. And you could hit potentially multiple nodes as everything's an API. Um, and because of the amount of services each one running as a container, and you could hit multiple workers. So Gvisor also allows you to um, scale it across multiple containers, across pods. Um, and then, yeah, to natural language processing. I hope I'm not going too fast, and everyone's still getting me. But um, so why natural language processing? Um, I came across a couple of interesting articles and tutorials around um, uh, especially log noise, uh, people doing research about the vast amounts of logs in different formats, and um, also more research along not just looking at application logs, but syscall, um, other uh, sources of security incidents, um, and the fact that it could uh, parse unstructured messages um, 
and uh, also allow a infosec or sysadmin or DevOps uh, person to uh, further enhance the processing of logs and the speed of it. Um, so if we look at kind of an example, um, at the end I'll, I'll have the links for a interesting exercise and tutorial around this. It's primarily built around CI, not so much InfoSec, but it's a good example or something to try um, to just get going. But the big thing is we want to establish some kind of baseline. So um, in my own baselines, I looked at just running Ubuntu by itself, um, running Elasticsearch, running Postgres for a while, um, and running some kind of like sane workload. Now the problem with that obviously being that we're assuming that that workload is safe at that point in time, which is a potentially dangerous assumption, but it's an assumption we have to uh, make. And then we would transform the data, uh, the natural language into something that uh, we can process, train a model, um, have it learn, um, tweak the model, and then um, once we've got a model that works, we uh, test it against anomalies that we have coming in um, and then constantly add to the baseline, retrain it. Um, so uh, the first step um, we want to look at is we actually want to start tokenizing the actual uh, language coming in. So we want to put it in a, 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 a format that the um, machine learning algorithms can use. So here's just a basic example to um, show uh, we want to look at frequency and where in the document it is. So um, we've got two documents, the quick brown fox and jumps over the lazy dog and then build a vector of where each one is. Um, but then um, I looked at multiple tokenizations because um, we've got a lot of information in each, each syscall. We want to start uh, looking at different ways of actually grabbing out the words and the meanings. So uh, a very simple one, a very easy one to implement would be a white space tokenization. So obviously between each um, item, we've got a white space, breaking it up. Uh, another interesting one that I found is the tree bank word tokenizer. So um, it's trained with a lot of words from newspaper articles. Um, and it's rather uh, good at picking up um, as well. But um, uh, at, at the time, I chose just the hashing vectorizer um, as it was efficient for the problem that I was trying to solve. Um, so essentially, um, when we're tokenizing, we're creating a hash of each word or um, item that we're picking up and putting it into a sparse matrix uh, matrix encoding, um, and that's how we're breaking it down so that we can um, um, process it later. And we, just as an example, and in the tutorial as well that you can follow, uh, we just map some of the data to see what it looks like, with the green dots being what we call our baseline and the red dots um, being something that we're testing um, so we can see kind of where it's classifying things. Um, and then I also looked at a term frequency inverse document um, vectorizer. So looking at um, not only the term frequency in each line, but in each document as well. But um, I haven't used that any further. And then, um, obviously, the, the point of the research is we actually want to classify the data. So once, once we've actually processed the data, we now have it in a form that we can um, use the algorithms, we actually want to classify it. So we want to say this type of data is um, grouped together or classified with other data. Um, so uh, one of the classic examples and where machine learning is used quite often is um, spam detection in your email. So um, it's quite a simple one. For the most part, we want to classify something either as spam or not. So um, 
when we when train it, we're essentially looking at, do we think it's spam or not? Are we um, confident that it is or not? Um, and it's a, a simple example to use. And uh, we have a bunch of classification algorithms. Um, and then I also looked at the, the, the big part of the research that I'm also doing is to actually look at the ease of um, implementing it. I don't want something overly, I'm not trying to save the world. I'm not trying to make something that people can't use. So it has to be simple. It doesn't have to be the most accurate, but we need to have some kind of, um, some, some point to start to look at things. Um, so for the most part, I've used uh, K-nearest, K-nearest neighbor. So um, for the most part, I want to look at how close is one data point uh, to another to classify them um, with the easy way to remember birds of the feather flock together. So we want to classify clusters. Um, and essentially, you've got a big database of your baseline and where does it lie within that baseline. So um, we're going to store the entire training set, um, and then um, it's easy to implement because you don't have to constantly train and learn it too much, um, and it makes predictions just in time. Um, but it can, uh, as my laptop knows, uh, take quite a bit of processing and uh, beat it around. Um, but like I said, I wanted to make this simple. I myself am not a machine learning expert. So I want something that I can learn quickly and get results uh, in the research and then take it further. So a visual representation of what this algorithm would do is it's trying to classify things based on how far it is from another data point. So we put a new example, a new data point, and we're trying to classify it based on what's around it. And we choose a distance of k to use in the classification. And uh, to visually represent how it would do that with a log line, um, it works out each word. Um, well, it works out the distance for that specific example. Um, yeah, each new event from the baseline. So uh, we've got a baseline. We assume that it's it's secure. It works, and then we add a new line. Something that's happened: event, uh, accessing a file, accessing the network, and we work out how um, sure we are that the event is um, outside of the norm or close to something else. Um, an example, just um, the data doesn't say anything really about what happened, but just an example of how it represents it um, in, the, in the example that I talked about earlier. So um, it, uh, for each new line going in, it's giving you a... Uh, uh, KN in score and then also the closest line or the closest data point to it from the baseline. Um, I also looked at the random forest, um, but that I'll leave to uh, further research. Um, it's a rather interesting classification algorithm, works really well, um, but I just haven't had time to look at it too much. Um, so just to go back, so largely we've got a baseline. Um, we're taking that, the, the log lines, each line in the document, transforming it into a matrix that we can use in the model, um, testing the model, so um, trying to see how accurate the baseline is, and then um, we're adding new lines into it and seeing if it's an anomaly or not. Um, that's largely the, the focus here. And just to remind you, uh, using the hashing vectorizer and then classifying it with k nearest. And then um, we'll, at the end we'll see if, it, if uh, the demo still works. Because I haven't made any sacrifices, so um, you might be sacrificing me at the at the altar. 
Um, so yeah, the, the contributions being to see that we want to add simple tools, simple techniques that uh, already have impact, already have uh, success in uh, being applied in other fields, and then seeing if we can find anything completely out of the ordinary. Um, so obviously I had to get sources of data, I spoke about it earlier, between 2017 and 2019's um, ELF binaries. Um, some of it include everything from uh, botnets on uh, IoT devices, routers, to um, uh, ransomware. It's a, a really a mixed bag, so I had to filter through it as well. And some of it, even though it's, uh, it's all just put under ELF binary, so you've got other architectures as well, and filtered it down. Uh, here's an example of Mariah that I found in there, which wasn't uh, applicable, but it's just an interesting example they already had. Um, and like I said, um, if you want to try something like this, there's a really good um, example called Quieting Log Noise with Python and Machine Learning, and it is very much uh, focused on CI. So um, it's, it's not a security-focused thing, but you could use the same uh, examples, the same logic to apply it um, to security. And uh, it goes step-by-step step through everything it's doing, uh, the steps, the theory that it's applying. Uh, it's an IPython notebook that you can just download and use. Um, so let's see. Uh, okay, so this this isn't a very specific example. Um, I've just taken Ubuntu as a baseline. I've run it for some time. And then I used one of the ALF binaries as an example. Um, uh, maybe just to talk about it, I don't have a slide about it, but I used Kimu um, virtualization with KVM and a Ubuntu just with Docker running inside Gvisor as well. Um, Gvisor is as simple as compiling a binary and adding it to a config for Docker and then adding it as a runtime. So. I've got the virtual machine running, I've got Docker isolating it, and then uh, Google's Gvisor. So I'm trying to kind of create a funnel as much as possible um, so that anything strange pops out, but then also trying to protect the uh, machine itself. And this is based off uh, Sysdig's uh, version of the syscall data. Oh, great. Just give me one second. Of course, of course, the sacrifice wasn't done. The demo gods are not happy. So let's see. Oh, yes. That's oh, massive. Okay, I think we're back. Okay, um, again, Ubuntu baseline, one of the uh, malicious uh, files we have. Um, and then purely we're just reading in each one as a separate line into a list so that we can process them. Um, Sysdig does love adding JSON and a whole bunch of other information at the beginning. So I'll clean that up. But um, what you can see is all the various scores happening while it's running. Um, that's just the baseline. And then cleaned it up, removed all the JSON data from um, Sysdig so that we just have the syscalls that we're looking at at the moment. Uh, so we've got... Um, so we've got the baseline file and the wrong file. Um, so looking at it, 
I've limited the length of the data that I'm using just because I ran, ran out of RAM quite a few times. Um, obviously, Amazon's amazing and just spin up massive machines until I forget about them and the credit card hits that. But um, ideally, if you're starting to look at syscall data, you either want to start cleaning it up, um, removing uh, things or looking at specific uh, parts of it, or just get more... Um, either more efficient algorithms or uh, a, a huge machine. Um, so just looking at some of the shape of it and just to look at what we're looking at. So it's gonna be difficult to understand this, but I've even like removed some of the data so you can see better. So um, probably because it's running in a Docker container, we see a lot of um, data all in the same place for green. Um, and then that was the the red obviously is what the the malicious uh, binary was doing um, and where it landed in the vector and then um, just looking at the size and then fitting it and once we've uh, fitted to the model uh, the k nearest um, so this isn't a good example it's not an accurate one at all but then um, we look at the distances and uh, the various examples that it found in the baseline. And I've just added a little bit more info at the bottom. So um, here we're looking at uh, the distance for a new item. We're looking at um, a comparative example in the baseline, and then the actual um, the actual um, item that we've tasted. Like I said, this isn't um, a, a very good representation yet. It's purely just um, something to to show um, at the moment. So. Um, Obviously, pretty and very um, dirty looking graphs, but um, but all of it can be tried yourself. Um, I'll try and do a follow up on it next year once I've got more results, as I'm still <laughs> writing the masters and working on it. Um, but the amount of code that you have to write, this the amount of um, work it is, the speed that it works. So far, it's looking good. Um, I just want to have more concrete results um, before we talk about it, and that's pretty much it. And then, uh, <laughs> I suppose that's probably at about a seven, <laughs> seven out of ten. Um, yes, yeah, sure. Um, any questions? Uh, okay, so the question is uh, if green is the good good code or the good binary and the red dots are the bad, um, what methods am I using to kind of look into it more isolated? So um, I've done none of that on that um, example, but um, what I've started doing is applying more seccomp rules to, um, to Docker and uh, limit the binary some more. Um, because a lot of the red dots are actually also just potentially something like uh, memory being mapped because the binary is being run or the binary is being executed, opened, a red. Um, so it's um, I'm still busy working on the isolation part and also other ways of visualizing it because that's still quite difficult to look at. Um, but uh, for the most part, the okay, K-nearest algorithm you start looking at uh, the classifications for specific things and then start looking inside of that to see which ones um, are problematic. Um, but it's also a bit of a shot in the dark because I'm trying to find things that haven't been there before. And you also have, uh, part of the difficulty is that 
you want to also look at not just a single line, but where in the document that line is. So if we think about any binary, right, it's executing multiple steps. It, uh, uh, any vulnerability is not one syscall or one action. So um, that's what I'm still struggling with is once I find something to then retrace the rest of it in the document. Um, so they still work in that, but for the most part, they're still, on my side, a lot of still human searching and intervention. And part of the research is, sure, it, it'd be lovely to find something completely automated, but at the moment, it's very much still, you know, uh, find an anomaly, like with um, Elasticsearch's machine learning um, abilities, and then actually go deeper and go look at the data itself. Um, especially on time series, then at least you can see in this period of time, so you you slice out that piece of time and look at it a bit, well, more closely. But um, some of the assumptions that I'm making is a lot of the binaries, the malware is going to try and do something immediately to set a foothold, and then I'm trying to look for things that happen further down periodically as well. Uh, okay, if I had to summarize that, so uh, in point detection, things like that already look at anomalies, right? And how does it differentiate? So maybe just um, at the moment, what I'm looking at mostly is just point detection. So if we just look at a classification, you know, these two points are so far from the rest of the points that something's wrong, right? Um, if I think about Microsoft has a, uh, what's it called again? Um, if it detects a virus on your machine and then uh, Sentinel-1 has something similar for Linux. Um, from what I learned talking to someone, it's a bit more of a contextual anomaly. So you're looking at anomalies happening across events, not just one single one. So you're on your Windows machine and you got an email and... Um, something happened. So at the moment, I'm merely looking at identifying a single problem and then some human intervention for that. But a lot of the current uh, products out there, what I'd say, it, it looks very specific to a platform or something. I'm trying to be very, I know I'm focusing on Cisco logs for Linux, but I, ideally, in the long run, any kind of text that's human readable, ingested and look for weirdness. But then the context is lost, right? So I think there, there is where uh, endpoint detection works works fairly well, is because you know you know the hardware that you're running on. Uh, there might be a certificate. Um, this is that machine. If it answers your question. Yeah. Uh, not at all. At, at the moment, I just looked at making my own data because finding existing data is hard. Um, Virus Total was a fairly decent source because they had um, logs, they had the binaries and stuff, but I haven't looked at it deep enough. Right now, I'm looking at kind of binaries and just seeing, is there anything that someone might have missed? Um, and then looking at it further and kind of building something around that. Uh, 
so to some extent, so how do I account for different uh, things running in the same environment. So partly that's where Docker comes in because I'm looking at a single um, isolated process. Um, but uh, that would probably get into the contextual stuff where you look at why is the database server doing what uh, it's doing something similar to what the application server is doing anomaly. But I haven't really looked at how you would um, differentiate at all there's also a, a lot to be said about just removing noise, uh, applications starting in a certain way. Um, even if it is a malicious binary, some of the syscalls will be the same. Um, but uh, yeah, um, but uh, it depends if if you uh, I try not to just go for something like network logs, um, pcap files and stuff like that. But ideally, if you look at pcaps and you just do it on a single network device and everything's running through the same network device, that would be one way of doing it. But here, um, I assumed I'm on a system in a container. I don't know what's around me. I. I I'm on the host, but the actual container running that I'm looking at is isolated from the rest. Well, that's this assumption I'm trying to make because I want a baseline to be safe, not that it's communicating out. Um, but, I mean, that's part of the problem is that potentially a container could, it's already talking to something else, but can you then, using the Docker daemons TCP, get even further? That's a hard one. I'll I'll think about that one a bit. <laughs>